all think I can't write a poem, but they are so wrong. I can write a poem. I wrote this one. I wrote this poem, and I gave it the title Binky's Poem. So shut up. The end. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> That is, uh, that has got to be where so I want shut to up! Yeah. And I say, hey, hey, what a wonderful kind of day. If you could learn to work. Well, thanks a lot, Jacob. It's a pleasure to be here. So, I want to start things off by asking you, uh, how you first got into voice acting, or when you maybe knew you were good with voices? Was it something you did as a, as a younger child, perhaps? Or how did that all come about? Um, well, I'm probably dating myself when i uh when i say monty python they're a, a british comedy troupe uh and as a kid i you know i would listen to that and mimic skits and accents and all the kind of silly funny voices and of course i grew up in the golden age of uh bugs bunny and daffy duck and foghorn leghorn and all those great characters so uh basically i mean i, I just pursued a love of acting that was kind of ignited in me in high school. My high school in Vancouver had a great drama program. And so that was kind of, uh, you know, really, really formative in, in, in setting me on a path to become a professional actor. So the voice work just kind of is one element of stage and TV and film. As, a, as an actor in Canada, you pretty much have to do it all. Can you maybe talk to me about your, your kind of first time uh, recording Binky and like, were you hired on to be both Arthur's dad and Binky or like, how did you come up with the voice? Just kind of bring me back to the origin of how you got involved with Arthur. That's a long time ago, Jacob. <laughs> um, you know what, I remember I remember getting a call. I remember golfing with a friend of mine. And I remember back then we had answering machines. So you'd call into your answering machine and enter the code. And I got a call from my agent saying, oh, you, you got the Arthur gig. And you know, I had no idea then that it would last 25 years. And it had been weeks since we auditioned. Um, so when we all went into the studio to do the first recording, I needed to have what I did in the audition played back to me so I could, so I, you know. So you, you like, kind of forgot what, what you went in with? Is that what well, you're saying? Yeah, exactly. You know, you, you, I remember doing something and they liked it and we were like, okay, this is where it lives. And, and actually for the first year or so, when actors would come in, sometimes they weren't in every episode, the technician would always have a little sample clip that they could play just to kind of lock the actor back into, oh, right, okay, it was a little lower or it was a little more nasal. So, yeah, Binky was just this, at first he was like really, he was tough, right? I mean, he kind of softened over the years. We found out he played clarinet and he had his, you know, his baby sister. and Ballet. He was exactly, he was afraid of the dark, all those cool nuances to him. But at first he was really, he really had that kind of, you know, tough guy thing. And so I think that's what I was really going for. And what they liked was that kind of, the bite in his voice. And uh, yeah, it, it, it stuck, you know, and now it's, like my my son is 16 and I drove him over to a friend's to go swim in his buddy's pool and I picked him up and as I'm we're we're driving away this his buddy's super tall like must be 6'2 and he was like uh could you do the voice <laughs> the voice of what uh Binky so I'm doing the you know and now I can just like I can flip it on and off after 25 years, it's it's a, it's a part of me. I think he's very multidimensional. You know, he's a he's a bully. He's a member of the Tough Customers, but he also does ballet and plays clarinet and sleeps with a nightlight. There's all these uh, <laughs> these elements that really make him a very three dimensional character. I think what the writers found. Well, first of all, I can tell you, <laughs> I forget his name. I should. I finally met Mark Brown, the creator of Arthur. Uh, a year ago when we had kind of a little get together to celebrate 
you know, the entirety of, of the show. And Binky is based, he was a teacher, uh, Mark Brown, and Binky is based on a kid that he had in his class. Oh, really? So I think what they found with Binky was that at first, if you go back and as you say, the evolution, he pretty much was the tough guy and the tough customer and that was his thing. And I think everybody started to find that not growing stale, but he was kind of boxed in to that. And then, yeah, slowly they'd pull out like this. Well, what if he played the clarinet? How crazy would that be? Or was afraid of the dark or so? Yeah, they started finding all these little elements to kind of extract from Binky that made him way more interesting. And, you know, my favorite Binky episodes were the kind of, you know, sometimes your character is there like from start to finish in an episode and the story revolves around them and they're super busy. I kind of like those moments when like Binky would kind of appear in a story and just say something completely off the wall, but totally nail the situation. Like, yeah, well, that's not going to work. And then boom, he's out and everyone's kind of like, yeah, he's right. It's not going to work. Those were, and, and that kind of evolution of his character allowed him to do those things. Because when he showed up, we kind of never know, knew which way it was going to go with him. Whether it was going to be a, a classic binky beatdown or whether he was going to, you know, uh, philosophize or stun us with some kind of revelation that, that you weren't waiting for. So, yeah, no, I... I kind of, as the actor, got to just go on that ride. I, I wasn't, I can't take any responsibility for that. I can just say that I thoroughly enjoyed it too as, a, as the performer and the guy who got to voice him. When you were doing uh, Arthur, was there any room for kind of improv and uh, spontaneous moments or was it pretty much whatever's written on the page is only what you're to say? Um, no, I would say there was room. I mean, the the scripts, you know, a lot of the scripts were written by uh, by Mark Brown himself uh, at the beginning. And because it's a kid's show, be because it was a kid's show, uh, everything was vetted. So, you know, there was a, there was a pretty, there was a, I'm not going to say strict, but there was a, shows had a theme and a message and they were very, very well written. And, and a lot of thought was given to why, you know, Muffy or Francine or, or Binky would behave the way that they would behave. So there wasn't a lot of room for just flat out improv. But there were a lot of times when we were able to maybe make things a little better or a little, a little funnier or change a word here and there, like, 20 years ago when we started doing it, we had, the whole cast would be in one giant studio in Montreal. Oh, really? So you'd, you'd yeah. simultaneously almost. Yeah, we would be, oh, wow. we'd have like, awesome. you know, eight music stands and there'd be, you know, all us actors and, and we'd first do a read through and then we'd, you know, do the script from page one to, and as things evolved and technology kind of changed, it got, unfortunately, less like that less like a group reading and you know you'd come in maybe with just one other character that you had scenes with and do you feel like it was maybe more difficult um to play off of the other actors or get the same delivery out of your lines when you weren't in that group setting or like which do you prefer as a voice actor inevitably when you're recording for uh original voice cartoons you can't overlap so you have to leave a pause, even if even if you and the performer are face to face. You, I I can't step on a single word you say or what you've just done is unusable. That, that there's no way a technician can clean my voice off your track. So it it honestly doesn't make much of a difference. You know the the oldest trick in the book for a voice actor is to always make sure that you're reading the character before you's line and that you're reacting 
in addition to that, the writing really holds up, especially in the first like six seasons or so. Like there's things in there that like you spoof or the show spoof South Park, it spoof Beavis and Butthead, uh, yeah. like the animated Batman, like the writing in particular was phenomenal. And there are still things my fr- me and my friends to this day quote and remember, we haven't watched the show in 20 years, but we remember these quotes and these lines and uh, yeah. much, much of them are Binky and Buster lines. Um, so yeah, maybe you could just talk on if what you thought of the show initially and maybe about some of the writing, um, especially in those early seasons. Absolutely. The show, while rife with morals, doesn't moralize. And I think that's the, that's probably the key to any good writing in any genre, right? Is for, is for the audience to not see it coming. But yeah, I, I, I agree with you. The writing in, in, uh, in those shows, especially early on, was, uh, was really exceptional. Yeah, and and exactly what you said. I think the fact that it doesn't talk down and it it seems almost first and foremost a comedy, more so than even a kid's show. Like, I remember my dad would want to watch it as much as I did. Yeah. And he's like a tough, like, biker, like, not at all your average uh, Arthur viewer. Um, But he still can remember, like, when I told him I was doing this interview with you, he said, ask him if he still sleeps with a nightlight. Like, he remembered, like, (laughs) he remembers all this stuff. So... It's interesting that the writing, even though it is a kid's show, um, and this is kind of the point I want to il- illustrate to some of the kids that might be watching, is even though you have a certain genre or a certain audience, you, you can still tell the story you want to tell in the most effective way. And if you want to add comedy, even if it is a kid's show, or you want to add different elements, um, you don't have to cave in just because it, it's a certain genre. You can kind of break out of that shell a little bit. Absolutely. I would say, yeah, that in fact, you know, kind of like that the opposite is true, right? Whether, I mean, you know, that's one of the principles of supposed comedic acting is you don't play the comedy of of the moment, you play the seriousness of the moment. You know, I mean, uh, that's the essence of, of clown. The essence of Mr. Bean is, you know, trying to get the turkey in the oven and it ends up on it you know it's the more you play against um against the obviousness of any situation i guess uh the better off you are because that's kind of how it is in real life we don't know that we're going to go outside and do something funny uh you know it's kind of letting it happen to you through the writing and through the storytelling do people recognize you from your voice, uh, like on the streets in your daily life? I live in a small town, so um, most people know what I do by now. I've lived here for 10, 11, 12 years. You know, all the cashiers and the bag boys down at the local IGA, they would, there was a time when it would, you know, it'd be like, oh, could you do the voice? And be like, Thank you. Yeah, no, plastic's fine or no paper, please. You know, and just to, and that like, but I, I do have like some stories. I remember when my kids were little, it would be my 16 year old when he was maybe, I don't know, four or five, his, his lifeguard, his, his swim instructor, mm-hmm. she came up to me one day all excited because her friends had said, oh yeah, he's, and she, she's like, you know, Arthur's my favorite and Binky's my favorite character. And would you, would you mind? Could you? And so I do the Binky voice for her and she just like starts bawling. She's just like, just like, she's so blown away. And it, that, that, that one's always stayed with me because kind of gives you a glimpse into the, the power that, you know, that nostalgia the the these voices that you don't associate with a person you don't associate it with you know one of the kids in your swim class's dad you associate it with your childhood and where you were and anyway it's a good it's a good kind of lesson about the power of uh of what we do sometimes and and how lucky we are so I've never forgotten that one anyway. What advice might you give to young people who uh, are interested in pursuing a career in acting or starting out, um, you know, people maybe 16 and under who want to get into this, what can they do to kind of better prepare themselves or to learn? Like uh, I'm not, I'm not 
paid by Nike or anything, but ju just just do it. That that would be the the best advice. Just do it if you love it. Find like seek it out in your community, and if that's not possible, I mean, there's all kinds of. You know, we have multiple platforms now, whether it's TikTok or, you know, uh, write it down. If you've got a if you've got a funny idea, an idea for a sketch or uh, just, yeah, just do it. Just create it, get it out there, get it on paper, get it on screen, get just, just get busy with it. Don't overthink it. And yeah, if you have a chance to, you know, whether it's community theater or just, yeah, jump at it. And the other thing is self-produce. Like we, it's an industry where, you know, you're kind of, you can be, if, if you're super passive, you can be waiting for your phone to ring. You know, uh, I would encourage anyone starting out in any facet of this business to do their own thing and, and self-produce their own ideas. And then, you know, one day uh, you're the one making the phone calls, so. Well, Bruce, thank you so much for taking the time to uh, chat with us. Uh, we loved having you and uh, yeah, best of luck to everything in the future. And well, thank you, Jacob. It was great meeting you. I really appreciate it. I had a blast. Get along with each other. Hey! What a wonderful